Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera everyone. Uh, also salam Ramadan to everybody. A very warm welcome and thank you for being with us on this beautiful Saturday morning for this Wacana Warisan series WWS lecture. My name is Fadli Idris and I represent the Malay Heritage Foundation, MHF. Uh, today marks the start of a new season for WWS webinars. We would like to thank all our returning participants for their continued support and we would also like to welcome new participants to WWS. So for the benefit of those joining us for the very first time, let me run through quickly what WWS is all about. WWS is one of uh, MHF's flagship programs. It comprises a series of webinars aimed to encourage the development of new approaches and alternatives towards the understanding of history, economics, politics, society, and culture. This year, we have six different speakers delivering the webinars. Aside from our speaker today, Dr. Nazri Bahrawi, we also have Dr. Rosalina Rawi, Dr. Norida Kamari, Dr. No Hanisa, Dr. Amin Farid, and Mr. Said Hafiz. Indeed, a very exciting lineup. One interesting point to note is those who attend at least five sessions will be issued a certificate of attendance. Please don't note that only participants who register via the Zoom link before the session will be eligible for this set. WWS webinars will be delivered in either English or Malay, and the webinar this morning will be in English. The webinar will be moderated by MHF Vice Chairman, Dr. Azhar Ibrahim, who delivered all 12 WWS webinars last year, as some of you are very familiar with. So uh, the topic for this morning will be intercultural animal fables of the Nusantara. Without further ado, let me now invite Dr. Azhar to commence the first WWS session in 2022 and introduce our guest speaker. Over to you, sir. All right. Uh, thank you, Fadli. Uh, very good morning, everyone. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah. And to our Muslim viewers and friends, um, Salam Ramadan. Uh, thank you for your time uh, this morning. And foremost, thank you to our guest speaker today, Dr. Nazrawi, uh, Nazri Bahrawi, all the way in states, in the state of Washington. And um, we are very delighted uh, the fact that he um, managed to squeeze some of his busy schedule yeah, uh, to be with us to share uh, this debut uh, 2022 uh, webinar series. Right? which will be conducted all throughout uh, via Zoom online. And um, we hope uh, this, this, this uh, forum will be a useful one for not just uh, our friends, yeah, but also the young ones. More so because uh, this material will be uh, recorded and posted in our uh, uh, MHF website. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Nazri Bahrawi is no stranger to Singapore um, discourse on literature. Uh, he is um, a scholar in comparative literature. Um, uh, he was uh, one time a um, senior lecturer at SUTD, and now he's a lecturer, uh, senior lecturer too, at the uh, University of Washington at Seattle. Um, well, I know Dr. Nazri quite some time ago, I think way back in year 2000, yeah, or even longer than that. Right? Uh, he's, um, he's a man of uh, eloquent words, yeah, uh, and he has uh, that strong take on comparative literature. Right? He's also uh, quite familiar with the discourse on Islam yeah, uh, and some kind of uh, comparative uh, interreligious uh, relations, yeah. And um, his, his work, yeah, actually you can see, you just Google, you can see many of his writings are floated uh, all over uh, the websites and the online material. And uh, if you know, remember, if you remember well, uh, some of his columns appeared in our local newspaper. That was Dr. Nazri Bahra. Dr. Nazri, how are you today? Right? Uh, what time hi, is that? Uh, uh, it's 7.05 p.m. Okay, so soon yeah. you will be having your um, uh, breakfast. Yeah, iftar is about 8 p.m. or so. So that okay. would be... Okay, all right, yeah. all right. All right, yeah. so this is the, your last round of hour, yeah? So yep. thank you again, Dr. Nazri. And uh, without further ado, Dr. Nazri will be sharing uh, this topic on intercultural animal fables of the Nusantara, a topic which is a very interesting one, indeed deserve to be... I think research again, 
yeah, or collated again, and then to make sense what is actually um, yeah, uh, useful for our uh, reflections, and especially in relation to now, uh, our interest uh, on the heritage uh, and uh, connecting of ideas. Yeah? Uh, so far, if we see that this material yeah, on um, Cerita Binatang, which is yeah, Cerita Haiwan, yeah, um, or very much being approached in the literary, anthropological, educational, uh, yeah, or some kind of the old-fashioned Orientalist cultural diffusion dissemination tropes. Yeah? And of course, there are various ways to approach this. And I think uh, today's take by Dr. Nazri would surely be an interesting one and let's hear from him. Yeah? Dr. Nazri, the time is yours. Yes. Please do. All right. Thank you, Azha. Let me share my screen now. Sure. Okay. You can see my screen? Yes, yes. That's good. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm going to uh, just, just be, uh, first of all, I want, actually want to say uh, salam sejahtera to everyone. And also selamat berpuasa to my fellow uh, Muslims. Very happy to join you this morning, your time. Thanks to the generosity of Fadli, Azhar and everyone else at the Malay Heritage Center. Uh, and I want to use the time today uh, to, to share my research of, about animal narratives, like Azhar said, uh, in the archipelago, Malay archipelago, over which I, I plan to do over the next few years. Yeah, All right, so, uh, okay, All right. And uh, I'm I'm very hesitant now to use the term Nusantara because uh, <laughs> yeah, Jokowi is using that for as the new capital city, right, of yeah. Indonesia. So uh, it's interesting that this imaginary of the Nusantara is uh, you know has taken has gone back to Indonesia. Started also uh, with the Majapahit Empire, of course, with uh, the Sumpah Palapa of the past, right. Uh, and it's interesting that it's gone back there, and you know, and we've been using it quite freely. So today I use the term Malay world for now as I try to you know, think about uh, how to use Nusantara in the future. Okay. Uh, and I want to start with look, thinking about uh, the WWS series, right? The, uh, and I, I saw that you know, last year there were a very few, a lot of uh, interesting talks uh, by, by, by you, Azhar. And they also sound so interesting. And I, uh, I think they're recorded, I hope. And then I, I would like to catch up on some of them. Uh, and I was particularly struck by one of those talks, and that is uh, the title of which is called Chendi, Chenda Kiawan Layu, Yang Menawan dan Melawan Dalam Sejarah. And I, I'm struck by it because I, I was thinking about the way it was translated into English. And I think maybe I'll share the, the, the feature here. Yeah, this is what I got from your web, the website of MHC. And when it's translated, uh, what struck me is how Melawan was translated, right? translated to Malay intellectuals, beauty and beast in history, right? And of course, uh, you know, thinking about my talks about the animal tales, animal narratives, and I'm thinking about how this translation is a movement from, from in English, it's a movement from a verb, right? A uh, verb, Melawan, right? And, and in when changed to English become like a noun, which is beast, right? And, and the beast in question is interesting because it's actually in, in quotation marks, right? The basis in quotation marks, which means to say that we need to rethink, like a, a discernible reader must rethink what this, what this term of the beast requires. It requires some unpacking, right? And, and I want to try to do a little bit of that, begin by uh, trying to unpack that uh, kind of what is meant by the beast here, right? And I think there is a sense here that the beast does not connote something negative. Uh, in fact, uh, Usually when you think about human-animal comparison, uh, beast is always thought to be negative uh, in, in a sense that the, the human is better than the beast, right? Uh, and, you know, we have rationality, we are smarter, uh, we, we, you know, have, have, we have things that the beast do not have and so we can control them and we are the custodianship of the natural order of the world, right? Uh, and, but here, when we think about the translation of the beast equatable to the uh, verb melawan, it's, it's uh, more traditionally uh, translated to, when we think about Malawan, uh, probably translated to something like to struggle against or to, to rebel, right? Uh, suggesting that there is a kind of uh, heroism, a valiance, uh, a kind of uh, traits that are valuable traits, right? Like that should be to be celebrated, right? So what I, I want to try to do today uh, is to, in the same spirit, right? To achieve 
what I want to achieve in this talk is to, to unpack some possible meanings associated with the idea of beasts uh, in the Malay archipelago, and in particular as they are represented uh, through literary narratives. And I want to try to do this by, uh, by, by suggesting to our audience that the, this is an understudied motif. Uh, and uh, not many people have actually gone in deeply into uh, animal you know, figures and narratives. And I think actually when if we look closely at it, we, there are a lot of things that we can learn from there. And, and one of the things that we can learn is how social relations are formed. Uh, and I will, I, will, I will point to some examples uh, in this talk. Okay, before I go into that, so that's where I want to go and that's how I, I'm thinking about uh, the, the talk for you today, the value for you today. But before I go into that, I think it's very important to also try to uh, situate the study that I'm doing within certain developments in the both in one in the academic sphere and number two in the public sphere, because I think this will help uh, the audience understand where I'm coming from. And so let me uh, go go into that now. First, I want to tackle academia, right? Uh, if you are someone who who does uh, Southeast Asian studies in in the academia, you would probably have uh, come across this article in the past few days, right? Uh, and this is an article uh, actually written in Critical Asian Studies. And this is an article that is uh, written by a Malaysian Chinese scholar based in uh, Michigan. And he's talking about thinking about uh, the state of Southeast Asian studies uh, in, uh, in on the whole, right? Uh, and I think, in essence, let me just uh, quickly summarize for you the article argue, in essence, that um, the, the, the name of the author is there, Wong Tian An. I think you can see the name. If not, that's the name of the author. And he, he suggested that uh, the discipline of Southeast Asian studies in bold here is very, has not come very far from its colonial and imperialist beginnings, right? So um, you can go in depth into this. He re references a lot of articles uh, and thinkers uh, from both the East and the West. Uh, but I, while I think I, I've read it, and uh, while I think I agree that uh, this article, the thrust of it is to call for us to rethink the discipline of Southeast Asia to decolonize, right? The word that everybody is using now, including myself, and I'm trying to think up through how to use it properly, right? To decolonize Southeast Asian studies. And I, I think Southeast Asian studies is important because it also, uh, Malay studies is, is kind of a link to Southeast Asian studies. Some people say it's a subset, some people say it's a dis different discipline, but certainly when you think about Southeast Asian studies, you need to also think alongside what is Malay studies, right? Uh, in the article, the, the author said, uh, talked about uh, Southeast Asian scholars like Syed Hussein Alatas and also Wang Gungwu. And he mentioned that uh, these scholars who are in, the, in Southeast Asia, uh, I think the word he used has not been able to establish their place in the canon in Southeast Asian studies, right? Uh, so he doesn't want to make a judgment on this matter, why, they, why this is the case, right? Uh, for me, I think uh, this, what he, you know, he makes a big claim and he has to qualify why, why this is not canonical, right? Uh, and I think he, he didn't do that, so it's very hard to engage with him on this ma matter. But I think he could have come up stronger to say that, you know, if let's say this works by Alatas or by Wang Gungwu is not accepted as, you know, canon, it, the reason is not because the, the, the scholarship is weak, right? And it's more because the dominance of Euro-America, right? In, in the knowledge uh, production, right? And we uh, existing in this big uh, circle of, uh, you know, network of knowledge. And, and so, you know, uh, these scholars are uh, not given their fair share of, of, uh, of let's say, uh, of attention, I think. This is the, the issue here. And he didn't say that. He, he just basically mentioned that they are not established enough. Uh, they are not canonical. Uh, and I think that he could have gone out stronger with that, right? So, for example, I think about the work that has done that has been done uh, by the Malay Studies in uh, at NUS and decades decades of work, right? I I surely think that this this some of these works uh, uh, can be can be canonical should be taught in Southeast Asian Studies courses, right? Uh, in in not just in NUS but actually outside of uh, Asia. Uh, it hasn't reached that standard yet, uh, and I hope that at least in my classes, uh, I begin to engage with them, right? 
So within this, this kind of climate of how knowledge has been produced, so what I hope to do with my research is to engage with primary sources from the region, right? Read them directly, engage with also ideas from within the region, right? And if uh, even though right now I'm operating from, you know, from far, from uh, uh, an American institution, I hope to, you know, try to do something that, you know, American-based, uh, you know, scholars have not been doing enough of, right? So in so doing, I think it is important to not to totally you know uh, deny uh, important works right, from done by euro american scholars and i think this is the argument made by uh, professor alatas and professor sina from nus uh, in their book sociological theory beyond the canon uh, they 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 argue that you know based on their teaching right they they think that you know there is not enough uh, attention paid to not just southeast asian scholars or asian scholars but also women scholars and so what they want to do is to try to balance the, the unlevel playing field. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the proposal was to study Jose Rizal, which is a Filipino, you know, a revolutionary who's actually an author, but also to think of him as a social thinker, right? And so that is something that I think uh, is very important. But at the same time, they, while doing that, they also qualify that we should not totally you know, disregard the works of, say, Karl Marx or something like that. Because some of these works from Karl Marx are still important. We just need to you know, rethink uh, how we want to use Karl Marx. And I think that's a very important point. Uh, so that's uh, where I'm coming from, from the academic sphere of where I see my work situated. From the public sphere, uh, and this is something that I've noticed in the past two to three years, the, the research would respond to a prevailing assumption, a very central assumption behind how ideas uh, are shaped in, in, in the region, in the Malay archipelago. And in Singapore, uh, if you've seen, uh, you know, with regards to race relations over the past two years, uh, Singapore has been privy to some uh, very, uh, you know, very public, very uh, discouraging racist incidences. Uh, and, and so, as the country is trying to grapple with how to deal with, you know, what, what's happening with, with all these very public, uh, is it COVID, right, they said, or is it something and all, all kinds of stuff. One, one very noticeable reaction that come out is, uh, is the idea of rejecting certain ideas from, uh, from that, cut, that came from elsewhere, right? Uh, so this has been expressed as westernization, right? So, uh, so that there is a segment of society that thinks that you know we should not be westernized. You know, we should not talk about privilege, uh, ideas of privilege, or notions of brown face because these are things that are that doesn't come from you know from Singapore itself. They come from elsewhere, right? And so the way to go is to just totally disregard them and deny them, right? And so what I've found in in at least the research engaging with cultural texts, you know, literary texts, is that uh, it is not 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 very helpful to try to pin social thoughts to uh, to civil civilizations and to, to prop up uh, civilizational dichotomies the east and the west the north and the south right uh, because because ideas uh, are social thought ideas you know literature uh, they are not they are interdependent they are rehashed and they are reclaimed right and so they are not copied blindly without any thought that means when when someone did you know bring them into uh, from one culture to another culture? There is a, a, a already a sense of agency. There is a lot of thinking behind it, right? And so that that is done with with you know with with some power on the uh, on the part of the interpreter, right? So uh, this is what I also gather from translation studies. When people talk about translator in the past, people think that translators always need to be faithful, must must take uh, this word and follow exactly what the author say. But in fact, no translations are faithful. Even the best of translation that, because the translator is bringing his or her or their own you know, kind of thinking behind it and certain word choices that they make, even though it seems like the right choice, is also based on their own prejudices, their own positionalities, basically, right? And so the same thing with ideas, when we bring it, you know, it's, it's the same, same case. We, we inject a bit of ourselves into those. That means there is agency. There is a there is a kind of reclamation, right? Even if it's a small act of reclamation, it is still reclamation. Okay, 
So from these two perspectives, I now want to move into animal fables. One is the uh, you know academic uh, development. Another one is uh, you know public sector kind of space, public sphere development. Uh, so how do we situate animal fables into this whole uh, this whole thing? So for me to move into animal fables, I think I want to talk a little bit about about the history of it very 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 briefly. Uh, obviously, if you, um, I mean, if you are from Malay studies, and this is not new, what I'm saying is that animal fables can be found in the hikayat genre, right? Uh, I'm sure many in the audience know that already, but if just to be on the same page, what what is meant, what I mean by hikayat, they are textual prose, usually originally written in Jawi, which is the Arabic script for Bahasa Melayu, right? And in, in its content, the hikayat is heterogeneous, right? It, it is, uh, you know, it has uh, a lot of reasons for being and a lot of uh, ways of being, right? Uh, and and uh, it encompasses historical writings, for instance, hagi hagiographic works, for instance, and also uh, compositions uh, bordering on kitab. I'm using the word of a, a, a scholar uh, from the West, actually, Vladimir, Vladimir Braginsky, right? Who did a, a very, you know, uh, in-depth study of Hikayat. He has a thick book that I'm uh, consulting. Uh, of course, I think uh, we can go deeper into where Braginsky fails in representing the Hikayat tradition. I think Azar has done some work there. And maybe we can talk about it later. So he mentions the kitab and what is the kitab, right? Kitab is another genre of classical Malay literature. Let me just move on. Okay, I'm going to go into this soon, but uh, let me just talk first a bit more. So Kitab is a, a, a genre of classical Malay literature that takes the form of a learned tre treatise in the pursuit of spiritual perfection. Meanwhile, the Hikayat began its life uh, in the early Islamic period of the Malay archipelago sometime in the 14th century. Some of the early hikayat uh, translations of Hindu, Buddhist, and Muslim texts. Uh, one example would be Hikayat Seri Rama, based on the Ramayana, right? And Hikayat uh, Muhammad Hanafiya, uh, based on a Persian text of the same name. Uh, and what I want to, uh, you know, just suggest here is one hikayat, which is an early hikayat called Hikayat Bayan Budiman, or Tale of the Wise Parrot, which certainly fits the bill. Uh, of the what are the kind of hikayat that I just described. It's uh, actually it's hailed to be one of the oldest classical Malay texts and it is a collection of animal fables. And uh, these this animal fables are in the form of frame narratives uh, adapted from uh, uh, an earlier text from Persia uh, called the Tuti Nama. And on the left here, you can see actually the text uh, is a, it's a picture I took from Google, but this is uh, the Persian text Tuti Nama. And on the right is actually uh, the, the text from uh, Hikayat Bayan Budiman is actually the publisher's page uh, detailing the dates and everything. Okay, so I wanted to uh, to to say that uh, animal fables have also been uh, expressed in classical Malay literature as allegorical poems or shair, right? That became popular in the nineteenth century and, and whose form can be traced earlier to to uh, oral folklore that even predates the hikayat, such as uh, uh, Donging Donging, Harimau Jadian, or Legends of the Were Tiger, right? Uh, again, I want to like refer to Braginsky. Uh, the uh, the Sha'ir, uh, he says, takes its subjects uh, as aspects of nature, such as birds, fishes, and insects. And he thinks that uh, uh, they do that because uh, to explore serious conversations and debates about religious, ethical, and philosophical problems. And, uh, and he, he draws them to like Sufi elements and doctrines because of course, the way uh, the region has been Islamized, there's a lot of Sufi elements that come with it, right? all the way to, uh, to Hamza Fansuri, et cetera. Right? Uh, so one of the other texts that, uh, that is also interesting in terms of uh, a sha'ir in the form of an animal tale is, uh, is this sha'ir called sha'ir burung pungo, pungo, or poem of the owlet. Right. This is, was uh, written likely in the 19th century and was based on an oral folklore. And the poem actually recounts the tale of a passionate uh, but doomed love affair between an owlet, a burung pungo, and, and, and the moon, uh, the bulan, right? Who, the, and the moon is actually uh, married or betrothed to the mythical Garuda, right? uh, the phoenix, uh, if you want to translate it that way. So when the Garuda found out about this illicit love affair, right, he sent his henchmen, all the other birds, right, uh, including the hawk, 
you know, the outlet who fought valiantly, but eventually uh, the outlet lost, perished, right? So, so again, uh, Braginsky, uh, he, read, he read a bit of the Sufi motifs in the poem, and he, he thinks that uh, the outlets uh, fly to meet the moon, uh, only to be called the bird, uh, only it call it the bird, which seems to uh, channel a famous saying, oh, sorry, yeah, I'm reading a bit from the text, so it was a bit uh, uh, confusing, yeah. So uh, this flight to the, to, the, to the moon done by the, the outlet actually uh, channels a saying by a Sufi saint, uh, Rabia al-Awadiyah, uh, and, and it's translated as you shall turn to him, him uh, in capital, and if he turns to you, of course, this is the idea of godliness that is being invoked, right? Uh, so in, in the examples of the Hikayat Bayan Budiman and the Sha'ir Burung Pungo, uh, I have fleshed out some instances of how uh, transcultural influences from Middle Eastern cultures, uh, whether they are Arabic, whether they are Islamic, whether they are Persian or not, suggesting that Malay uh, literatures have had a long history of engaging with poetics that are not from just the region, but from also the Indian Ocean. Okay. Uh, so this, this kind of trans, transcultural engagement actually continues into a 20th century uh, translation of another text that I want to look at, which is uh, Hikayat Kalila dan Dimna. And I want to briefly consider that, that text now. Okay, And these are uh, some of the translations of Kalila dan Dimna, right? So before the text actually reached the shores of the Malay archipelago, the Malay world, the, 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 the Malay version of Kalila dan Dimna had actually traveled a fair deal in other parts of the Indian Ocean, right? At the height of the Abbasid period empire, during the period hail as the Islamic Golden Age, uh, the text was translated from, uh, from middle, middle Persian to Arabic by uh, a very famous uh, thinker of the Abbasid period, which is uh, Ibn al mukaffa uh, an author or scholar who he said to have died around 757 CE. So this Middle Persian version is actually attributable to a Persian physician called Burzoi. Let me uh, let me show you a little bit of a, a map of how it came into being, right? So uh, Burzoi actually lived in the sixth century, and this version was in turn adapted from the Sanskrit text Panchatantra, which was credited to Vishnu Sarma, who lived somewhere between 100 BCE and 500 CE. So it's very hard to attribute it because it was so long ago, and I guess scholars are still divided about the origin. But we know that the, the very first text that is attributable to the Kalila dan Dimna is actually an Indian text, a South Asian text called the Panchatantra, which is uh, uh, the, the one that you see on screen. Right, uh, not not the picture, but uh, the first one. And in the Malay archipelago, uh, the adaptation of Kalila Wadimna uh, can be said to have had four origins. Okay, and I'm just gonna show you uh, the four origins now. Okay, these are versions of the text that you can see on screen. And you might notice that there is a lot of drawing graphics that comes with it. The, Okay, these are the four trajectories. There's a lot of information there, but I'll try to uh, talk to you, talk through with you, right? Okay, so uh, the sole text in this trajectory that, re that, that traces itself to the Pancha Tantra, the Hindu version, is actually the translated version by uh, Munshi Abdullah called Hikayat Pancha Tandaran, right? And actually he did not translate it from Arabic, don't know he had translated it from the Pancha Tantra. He translated it from a, from his friend's work from Tamil. His friend uh, actually translated uh, Pancha Tantra into Tamil. And his friend's name is Tambi Mutu Birafatar. And, uh, and, and then later, uh, uh, you know, uh, because Munshi Abdullah can read Tamil, he is uh, part Tamil, right? And part Arabic, but also a champion of the Malay language. He, uh, he uses that, that Tamil mastery to translate it into, uh, into Malay. Uh, and call it Pancha Tandran. And Pancha Tandran has five short, short chapters, which correspond to the five books of the Pancha Tantra. So Pancha Tantra is a voluminous work with volumes, and Pancha Tandran is five chapters. So it's a, a bridge version actually of the of the whole thing. So you can already see, you know, it's not a faithful translation because you know things are uh, already choices have been made to cut it down, right? And the second Malay version actually was published in 1876 by a, a Dutch man 
called uh, JRTF Congrip as Hikayat Kalila dan Dimna in 1876. Later, this was reprinted. And actually, the third adaptation by Gongrip also was, co was considered a trajectory uh, in 1886. And this text has a, a very long name. Dalang Atawa dan Segala Cerita Dongeng Yang Telah Dikarang kan oleh Hakim Lokman dan Bit5, right? Uh, translatable, when it was translated into English, was storyteller or every legend and fairy tale ever written by Magistrate Lokman and Bit5, right? And actually, this text, this uh, third version is, uh, uh, you know, trans, uh, you know, traceable to another version, 1781 French version. But that's not important. Just need to know that there are three versions so far. And I think the last the last version is the most, the last trajectory, the most interesting one, the one that I, I'm very much attracted to. And, and that is the, the direct adaptation from Ibn al Mukaffas, uh, Kalila Wadimna, right? Liao, Liao Yokfang actually identifies two texts in this strain. He, he identifies a 1962 version by Haji Khairuddin, published in KL, and a 1964 version by Ismail Jamil, published in Jakarta. So one published in uh, Indonesia and one published in KL. Uh, uh, so he identified those two versions. Uh, and then he also mentioned uh, that there is another version called Hikayat Kalila dan Damina, published in 1978 by Hania, also in Jakarta. So there, there were more Indonesian versions, apparently, uh, when it was uh, you know, uh, translated into uh, Malay languages, right? Uh, but uh, in my research, as I go along, uh, beyond what Liao, Liao Yok Fang says, there, I discovered that there are three other versions in this, this train, and these are the, the last three. Uh, and and uh, one is the 1960 version, which is very interesting. I haven't actually gotten uh, to reading it. Uh, Hikayat Lembu Dengan Singa. And then there's a 1991 and a 2003 version. 91 is a, a, K, a Selangor version, and 2003 is published in Yogyakarta. So I want to just uh, now, as we go along now, just quickly uh, talk about the last two versions that I think is in interesting. The Badrol version and the Misbah version. So the Selangor and the uh, Yogyakarta version. And I want to just focus on uh, characterization or perwatakan, right? The, uh, so the Badrol version uh, reproduces the animal, animal types of the al mukaffa text. So it, it is very faithful in that sense. It reproduces and it just produced as, as is, and this is the Selangor version. But the, the Misbah version actually customized the creatures to reflect the realities of the Malay archipelago, right? Uh, so in, in the story, the Lion King is, that was previously a Lion King, has become a, a Tiger King, right? Uh, and uh, in, the, in the original version, there are two jackals, they have become wild dogs, right? And in the version, the ox has become a, a buffalo now, right? So this is the Joke Jakarta version, oops, sorry. Okay, so it appears that this customization uh, may be a cosmetic change only because if we consider the text sub stories and how it recounters, one of the sub 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 story in the text is a, a story about a clever rabbit uh, and how the rabbit manages to outwit a, a lion, a ravenous lion, and save the fellow its fellow creatures in the forest by tricking that that lion, that hungry lion, into attacking its own reflection in a well. Right, so that's a very interesting story. But in the Badrul version, which is the uh, the Selangor version, the rabbit has been transformed into a kanchil, a mouse deer, right, an animal that is indigenous to the region, of course. And this change is significant because what it does is it actually channels existing uh, folk tales or cerita rakyat of the of the of the Malay world, in which the kanchil can be described as a signifier of the hero trickster figure and a role model that we should emulate. So in the wild, the kanchil is, is small, it's elusive, shy, but also, uh, also uh, you know, listed as an endangered species, but actually it's a, it's a hero to other, uh, other, uh, other creatures. In these folk tales, the shy, shyness has some connection to its individualistic character. So according to a, a researcher, uh, Kathy Carpenter, she studied uh, kanchil stories in Indonesia. And she said that these folk tales seldom feature more than one kanchil, and while the creature may team up with other creatures, at, at the heart of it, it's concerned about the the kanchil is concerned about its own well-being to the detriment of others, right? So the idea that the kanchil can be actually less than good or less than a hero is not limited to actually Indonesian folk tales of the of the mouse deer. It is also uh, present in folk tales from Malaysia, where the kanchil is also known as the pelando, right? Uh, according to a researcher, uh, 
Si Hun Piao. He, he, he did a cultural, uh, a comparative study of Malay and Chinese trickster tales. And, 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 and uh, the researcher said uh, the Kanchil has even been presented as a bully, right? He points out to one tale where the Kanchil and a stork uh, at first partner, partner up to cross a river by riding a rice crust uh, across it. But unknown to the stalk, the Kanchil actually begins to nibble at the rice, the, the crust, right? And then when, and once it realized that what was happening and saw that the crust was going to sink into the river, the stalk flew away, leaving the Kanchil on it almost to, almost to drown, right? But the, the person who made the hostile move was not the stalk, but the Kanchil, right? So the Kanchil was a bit of a trickster, but also selfish, right, in that sense. So there, there is a darker version of the Kanchil, and the Badrul version presents the Kanchil actually in a nicer light. Uh, so in the, in, in the Badrul version of uh, Kalila Wadina, the Kanchil is actually uh, a socially conscious Kanchil who was trying to wriggle its, uh, its way out of communal duty uh, when it came to its turn to be the lion's meal, right? Uh, instead, it directed its, uh, its ruse to the jungle's common enemy, which is the big bad lion. Uh, and, and in the Badrul version, the Kanchil takes on the same moral imperative of the Al Mukafa version uh, that had introduced uh, into the uh, just just the same version, right? So it's not a, a again. I'm what I'm saying here is that it's not a simple case of uh, unthinking mimicry. It doesn't blind uh, blindly copies the, the original, changes it, but uh, changes it to customize it to the to the archipelago, right? So by changing the original character of the rabbit to the renowned crown tail. Badrul also speaks to the Kanchil's representation as a folk hero, as opposed to a folk villain. Okay, uh, how are we doing for time? We we doing okay? Yeah, okay, can. Um, I'll 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 need about five more minutes or so. No worries. No worries. Time is just okay, great. All right. So, uh, so in other words, what I'm trying to say is that the text uh, it has an intertextuality. Right? It refers to other texts, right? And it's not a super simple case of superficial adaptation, but actually an active case of indigenous uh, figure, mythological figure, right? Uh, that meshes both the Arabic and the Malay literary trope. So it, it's kind of a inter intermixing of both, right? Uh, and in fact, the Kanchil is not the only animal figure that is a uh, that lends itself to the to oral folk tales of the Malay archipelago. Uh, in in the joke Jakarta version, the Misbah decided to change the Lion King to the Tiger King, as I mentioned, and this actually uh, re references the uh, Donging Donging Harimau Jadian of the region. And I want to explain this a little bit further, actually. Okay, so you see a map here of uh, of uh, some legends of the of Harimau Jadian in Peninsular Malaysia, right? Uh, so consider the legend of Dr. Datuk Paroi of Gunung Angsi in Negeri Sembilan on the left side of the screen. Datuk Paroi is that, and his followers are spirit tigers. Uh, that means that they, beca they became Harimau Jadian or were tigers after they died as humans. Right? At their village, uh, Datuk Paroi and his followers actually engage in human activities like, like farming, like studying. And they were also good Muslims that actually read the Quran and performed their daily prayers. And, and, and in fact, to, to hone their fighting skills, they, the Angsi were tigers actually practice silat. And legend has it that Datuk Paroi had once single-handedly defeated a, a gang of were tigers from Gunung Ledang, who actually served the mythical figure of the Putri Gunung Ledang. Uh, and the Datuk did so at Bukit Putus. You can see the battleground up here, right? They met here and the Datuk single-handedly one person beat a lot of uh, 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 wear tigers from the Gunung Ledang gang, right? So it's a basically I'm describing a gang fight, right? Uh, the Dato did so because members of the Ledang tigers actually had caused chaos in Dato Paroi's territory and he was protecting the people who live in his territory. So the, the Ledang tigers actually were a different kind of uh, Harimau Jadian or wear tigers. They, are, they were known as Harimau Berantai, right? Or Enchain tigers. Uh, because they can be violent in their tiger form and they had to be magically chained. According to uh, uh, Pendeta Zabba, right? he wrote an article about them actually. Uh, let me show you. right. And this is a quote from his 1951 article that uh, the moment any of them take on the shape of a tiger, they become vicious and dangerous again. And so save the surrounding country from the de deprivation, their movement to save the countries. They had to be restricted by way of some mysterious power, heavy chains around their neck. That's why the, the name Harimau Barantai came, came about, okay? 
Uh, and it's very interesting because they, they were different in the way they become the were tigers. Like they were not uh, uh, Harimau Jadian that become uh, Harimau Jadian after they died. They actually are shapeshifters. They, they can change their shape between humans and animals, right? Uh, so what's, what's the link here with Kalila and Dimna? So going back to that text, Kalila and Dimna, uh, the, the Misbah translation from Yogyakarta actually changed the Lion King to the Tiger King, seemingly to, to channel the legend of Datuk Paroi, right? It doesn't mean that there is a, a kind of link, but certainly there is a, there's a kind of a similarity there because it portrays the tiger as a noble king protector uh, in pursuit of social justice, right? In the example of, uh, from Kalila dan Dimna, we can see that there are instances of continuity, but there are also instances of change between different cultures, uh, indicating that ideas circulate in, in, a, in a very uh, true literary networks in a very interesting way. So we see this kind of intermeshing come together uh, and, and it does so in a way where the reproducer is not simply taking what we in the modern world would call a cut and paste uh, approach, right? Uh, I've taken a, I've spoken a lot about the adaptations of the traditional text, and I'm very aware of time. But I want to end this off by talking about a modern text, uh, and in fact, one short story from a Singaporean writer whom I've translated, um, Cikgu Latif or Muhammad Latif Muhammad, right? Uh, and I just wanted to finish this off uh, to show you the two tribe of tigers: one spirit tiger, shapeshifter, so that you get a sense of it. Okay, let me talk about one story from uh, Cikgu Latif. Uh, uh, Muhammad Latif Muhammad has written a collection of short stories called Nostalgia Yang Hilang. And uh, Azhar has worked with me on translating this, this, this text uh, that came out as Lost Nostalgia a few years ago. And one of the stories that I noticed from this text is actually originally titled Lembu, right? And I've translated it to Bovine. Uh, and the story was in Malay, originally published in Berita Minggu in February 1986. To give you a short synopsis, the story actually revolves around a pair of, of uh, bovines, basically a bull and a cow, who, who works in a farm under uh, terrible labor conditions in an unnamed city, not unlike Singapore. Right? The bull recalls that his late father telling him that there is a mythical place called Panchasona, where cows were treated, uh, are treated as sacred creatures, and they are allowed to roam free, and they have the life that they do not have at right now in you know, being like berantai to, to the farm, right? Uh, he begins a journey to, to, to this place, this Panchasona, and he and on the way to this place, he, he was an angry bull, right? He began to rouse other enslaved cows to join him. And together they became, you know, like a herd of cows. As they con as they move to Panchasona, they also confront their human masters in an act of rebellion. So as they run towards their freedom. So this really makes me think about that Malawan and Beast kind of translation of the, the talk earlier, right? To, to, to Malawan is a, a kind of beastly act, right? So unlike Kalila and Dimna, we don't get a sense that, that, that this story is actually uh, linked to an established story that came from elsewhere, right? But actually this story still can be described as intercultural because while it is not precisely said, Pancha Sona uh, is actually a utopia where cows are treated. And it certainly uh, channels uh, Hindu practices, right? Uh, and uh, of course, considering that, you know, uh, in, in this part of the Malay archipelago, uh, there has been uh, some denial about the Hindu past uh, in the Malay world. Uh, Chegu's Latif story can itself be considered revolutionary. It's a rebelli rebellious story, just like the, the, the protagonist in that story. His method to, is to, to kind of champion a cause, right? And that cause is a diatribe against modern day bondage. And, and, and this is reminiscent of, a, of an earlier tactic used by uh, 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 an Indonesian Dai, very famous named uh, Sunan Kalijogo, who actually you know, has intermeshed Hinduism and Islam for a cause he believed in, which is actually the spread of religion. There are two different causes, but he, they, both, uh, you know, both authors or uh, figures believe that they are fighting for it and they are willing to, to engage with intercultural elements from different parts of the world, even though it might be uh, in, in traditional sense, might be considered, uh, you know, sinful, right? Or, or, or not welcome. So it's just interesting to note here that the ideas and methods refer to uh, it's not from faraway places, but also from the region. And, and if this can be read as intercultural, it's the intermeshing, not of geography, geographical location, but actually temporal cultures, the past and the present, right? So interculturality is not just about 
uh, you know, localities, but also about time, right? How you uh, mix with uh, values of the past and values of the present, right? And how you might, uh, you know, uh, change that and direct that. So I just, uh, I just want to end here. Actually, I want to just uh, share some few very pre preliminary observations based on these case studies. Uh, the, uh, one is that there is a wealth of knowledge, of course, that we can gather from, uh, from animal narratives. And, and that this, uh, this is really an understudied literary genre, but, uh, and it's something that is less privileged than, say, works of historical uh, fiction, right? Uh, but these texts can reveal information, like I just mentioned about uh, the society, as much as those texts. Uh, and second, I think it's very important to think about how modernization happens in the Malay Indonesian world uh, or cultures. And, and, and sometimes we think about, uh, when we think about modernization, we always think about the rationality in, impulse, right? That uh, to modernize means to embrace reason and rationality. And this actually relates to uh, ideals of the European enlightenment, which is, uh, you know, on the back of, uh, that came to the region on the back of Dutch and British colonization. But some people have also said that actually, uh, and uh, the rationalization has come with uh, the Arabic Nahda movements, right? In the case of Said Sheikh Al Hadi and the Al Manar, you know, kind of magazine, right? But uh, what I'm suggesting is that modernization can also be looked as a process of adaptation, a process of translation in the, in the literary networks, right? We go deep into the text and you can see that actually things have changed, certain values progress, and they are progressed by way of li literature, right? And how we engage with ideas through fiction. And, and I think I will end there. And I want to thank you for your attention.